Thank you, Mrs. Davies. And thank you most especially on behalf of the university for putting together this series of talks. Um, it's kind of nice to pull professors out of their classroom and into a field where they're uh, basically amateurs, don't know much more than you know or could find out uh, fairly easily on your own. So I appreciate that opportunity to give these talks. Uh, as Mrs. Uh, Davies mentioned, this one talk belongs to a series uh, of talks. Do we have the backwards? There, there good. Uh, a series of talks. Uh, and Mrs. Davies gave you the uh, academic sounding title to it. I have a different title to it. I call it Romancing a Room. It's a series where I, where I fell in love with a room and I would stay there for long periods of time. And after a while, you, be, you begin to hear one side of the wall talk to the other side of the wall. And you see that the ceilings talking to this side of the wall these paintings are talking to one another and in such a way that with your eyes you can hear it. Yeah, you can actually hear what they're saying with your eyes. Right? And furthermore, these buildings are integral. They're a complete work. Uh, you don't have to go to a museum to see a part of it. It's actually there where it does its own work, or at least once upon a time did its own work. They're, they're somewhat sleeping now and then until a person comes in and wakes it up so that it will talk again. So I encourage you to, to romance some of these rooms. Stay with it. It requires uh, that you grant that there's some intelligence there, that you grant that, uh, that they will speak to you a bit. And uh, you also have to... Romance is not a bad word for this because you have to be taken by their beauty. And that's what keeps you there for a little while anyway. Do you begin to th see that not only on the surface are they beautiful, but their thought is beautiful. And you can actually begin to see that. It's really marvelous. We don't do that anymore. I don't know of a modern building that does anything like that. Andrew, do you know of any building that... No. They don't do that anymore. There's nothing to love in a building anymore, or at least to talk to. Anyway, whether we'll that be the case or not. All right, I want to get on with this talk. It is called, uh, 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 well, what is it called? Uh, it's a horrible title. The Civic Work of Mercy. All right? And it's also the meaning of Tintoretto's program for the Scuola Grande di San Rocco. And just so you don't get lost in all my words and pictures, I'm going to actually be doing, this takes place in five chapters, very tiny chapters. I'm going to show you a place. Then I'm going to show you a patron. Patron here really means patron saint. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about an artist, Tintoretto. And then there's a, 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 an institution particular to Venice called the Scuola, Scuole. Uh, you and I might literally translate it as school, but it's really not a school. It's an it's a institution where adult men or adult women congregate in order to do something special, usually of a civic uh, service or a religious service. And then Tintoretto decorated the Scuola San Roque. So I'm going to talk about his program. All right? So you can keep track as I go through these things. The program itself, in other words, what these, wor what these pictures mean, what they say to us, is uh, the, 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 the elements of the story, the storyline you will all recognize. It's called Salvation History which has three or four moments in it. You guys know the first moment, right? Old Testament. What's next? Just kiss. If the Old Testament is the first part, what's the second part? The New Testament. Right. And then the third chapter has to do with what's going on today. And the final chapter, which is not quite written, but we can anticipate it. Do you know what that is? No one knows what happens at the end. 
No one can, knows the end of the story here. But I wrote, <laughs> yeah, final what? The second coming or the restoration, uh, the return to, to paradise, really. Uh, uh, okay? So, uh, there's divine providence, but very, very selective. Then there is the display of works of mercy. And then finally, there is a display of what we can call sacra povertà or sacred poverty. All right? Uh, so let me get on with the story and the pictures. Uh, ish. It's a place. Do you know what place that is? It's not, it's not Germany. It's not Rome. Venice. 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 Yeah, it's Venice. And in a moment, we're going to go right here. We're going to zero in on Rome. Not in Rome, on, on, on a place called Campo. It's, a, it's like a piazza or plaza, but they call it campos in, in Venice. This is Campo San Rocco. This is a church dedicated to San, Saint Rock or San Rocco. And this is the Scuola San Rocco. There's a better picture of it. Uh, no, this is the exterior. A little bit squashed in. It's actually spread out a little bit more and a little shorter. These proportions aren't right, but fair enough. There's at least a door that we can go in. When you go in the door, you're, in the, you're going to go on the bottom floor. This is called the, uh, the Sala Inferiority, or there's, a, there's another name for it, and I can't remember what they call it. The Sala Inferiority, or, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is the place that common folk could come into. Ordinary folk, when the doors were open and you were invited in. But then when you go up, oh, wait, wait, before you go upstairs. I don't know if you can see that arch. There's an arch. Grand staircases, fantastic staircase. You just want to walk up it, and then you want to walk down it, and then you want to walk back up again. Because as you're walking up, you feel like you must be better than you are, grander than you are. It makes you feel important as you walk up those steps. And then, rightly so, because when you get to the top, you're in the sala superiore, the grand room, or the upper room. And you'll come in, let us say, let us say uh, you'll come up this doorway, and you will be in a fairly long room. It's about 100 feet, roughly 100 feet. And up top, you'll see, oh gosh, I don't know how many paintings. There's a big one, there's a small one, there's a big one here, there's a big one there. There's these side paintings, there's these uh, uh, on, the, on the ceiling, and there's these side paintings here. Uh, wonderful, wonderful paintings. I'll go through some of them. But then there's a little, and this is just for the members right, of, the, of, the, of the institution. And there's another place, a small room. Uh, you go in from that uh, a side door off of that uh, big room we were just in, and you go into this room, which is the meeting room where the, the bigs would meet and make policy, right, and uh, make decisions and do their voting and so forth. And this room is dedicated to the crucifixion. There you can see uh, uh, Pilate with uh, Jesus, and here is Ecce Homo, where their soldiers are, are showing this. Yeah, this is a man. And here is on the way to Calvary, and I think we got the other side of the room. And this is a, a grand, grand painting. Uh, the proportions, uh, you can hardly do the proportions right, but that thing is about, let me see if I can't remember my numbers real well. That painting is um, 40 feet long. Uh, hey guys, what's the distance between f first base and second base? 90 feet. 90 feet. So that's about halfway there, roughly halfway there. Right? So it's 40 feet long and it's, uh, it's what, uh, uh, 17 feet high. And that's a canvas painting. That's almost a whole cow there, or maybe two cows. All right, that's a canvas painting. They had to stitch a bunch of canvases together. It's magnificent. Uh, somebody called it an epic, uh, an epic, epic uh, uh, picture of epic proportions. Okay, place, continue. Now we're going to see a patron. Yeah, he'll be there. Yep, we'll go back. This, uh, I'll tell you the story real quickly about San Rocco. Uh, it's in those details next, but all I want to say is in that room we were just in, the meeting room where the bigs would meet, at the very top of the ceiling, 
right in the center of it, is San Roque. He was a very, very popular saint from about the 16th century all the way into the beginning of the 20th century. I don't think he made it much into America unless you were Italian. The Italians were real big on it. The French were real big, real big on it. The French are a little bit ambivalent about their Catholic roots, but the Italians aren't. And so uh, they're real big on San Rocco. Lots of Roccos in Italy. Uh, uh, and here he is being lifted up into heaven. You guys have seen the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. Well, this isn't an assumption, but he's being lifted up into to heaven. And there's, my goodness, God the Father coming to greet him, along with these angels lifting him up. Go on, please. Well, here's, here's just the, 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 the details on San Rocco. He's the patron saint. He was born in Montpellier, in France, into the 13th century. He quickly was made a saint, or acknowledged as a saint, in 1414. He was a healer of the plague. The plague was a scourge of a disease in the, uh, in the 15th and 16th century. Also, Venice had regular, uh, regular epidemics of the plague. As a, as a port town, you kind of imagine all the ships coming in there and those rascally rats coming off and the sickness and the, the extraordinary number of poor people that lived in, in Venice. Uh, so you know, it was just a breeding ground for, for the plague. Uh, he is much venerated for, what, five centuries? I mean, nobody can remember me 500 years from now, but look at that. People, people venerated that guy for 500 years. And here I am, another 100 years later, talking about him. Uh, the iconography, when you see him, he's usually wearing a pilgrim's cloak. He's got a staff, the gourd to drink water out of. He's got a wound in his thigh, uh, usually kind of festering wound in his thigh, which uh, different stories told about that, but the most likely one is it was a, it was a sore that had, had set in from the plague. And at his feet there's a dog, because at one point he was so sick he, couldn't, he just had to find a place to, to hide so robbers wouldn't uh, 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 pester him. And the dog would come regularly and bring him food. His feast day is August 16th. And I told you that, all right, next. So that's the patron, here's the artist. Yeah, he says, I'm standing in your way, that's why. Uh, one of my favorite portraits of all time. This is self-portrait. <laughs> okay, just coming out of the black. This is Tintoretto. I think, if I can make that out, it says Ipsum. Me, myself. Let's see something about him. Let's get some data on him. He was born and died in Venice. He apparently left Venice one time for less than a month. Can you imagine? Where are you from? Dallas. Can you imagine never going out of Dallas? Except one time? And you lived to be about 70 years old? He did. Socrates did that. He, he never left Athens except for one time to go to war. Uh, even Jesus wandered around. Uh, okay, his real name was Jaco Robusti. His father was a, a dyer. And that's why, because he's a little short guy, apparently. They called him the little dyer. That's where he gets his nickname, Tintoretto. Okay, okay. His wife was Faustina. They had a large, well, we think of it as large now. He had a middle-sized family. Uh, and he ran a prosperous workshop, a painting workshop. Played the whole family couple generations of them. And during this period of time, what is that, 24 years, he f painted 64 paintings, all for that one room. He's doing other things too. But what you're gonna see is a, a, a building, upstairs, downstairs, and in the little room, with 64 paintings. He did them all. Okay, that's good enough. Squala. Squala is an institution. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the institution. It's right up there. I'm gonna just read it as well as you do. Uh, they were civic associations, they were actually institutions. Uh, they're like the Holy Name Society or your mother's uh, sodality or the, um, the Nurses Association. But they were, they were local and they usually had just one outpost. Uh, that outpost was called uh, a squola. But it was a recognized institution. These days we would say they were a 501c3 charitable institution that's non-taxable. 
uh, but th they had the uh, you know stamp of approval by the state of uh, of, of Venice. Uh, they were organized around a particular nationality or a particular craft. You know, there was a the carpenter scuola, there were the uh, the Polish scuola, there were the, uh, those who were do devoted to the praying of the rosary. But they had different scuola for all different reasons. But each one of them had uh, a particular class of. Uh, of, uh, they, de they devoted themselves to a particular class of infirmity or need, such as the blind, the orphans, the widowed, the hospitalized. And uh, as I can assure you, I won't go into the details, but the poverty in Venice uh, was huge. Uh, uh, and it was um, multicultural, multinational. It was a real mess. They had the the wealthiest of the wealthy in Europe, and they also had the poorest of the poorest on that tiny little island. Yeah. No, they were self-governing. And the interesting thing is, by, by, by their constitutions, keep the priest away. <laughs> no priest. They already had plenty of authority. And keep the patricians the, the nobles away. No, they were not allowed to participate. They weren't allowed to rule. They could watch. They could donate. But they had no... And this is very, very important. Because you see, in Venice, there were two classes that ruled everything until about, uh, let's say, about, about the 13th century. They were the nobles, the bigs, and there were the clergy. Right? Catholic. They're all Catholic. The clergy. And no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how uh, talented you are, tough. There's no place for you in that world outside of do your job, keep quiet, until they founded these institutions. And the laymen did things that no one else would do. Priests didn't get their hands dirty for God's sakes. They stayed in the church with their robes on and said their prayers and did the Holy Eucharist, and then they would go eat with the bigs. The bigs didn't do that, for God's sakes. They're of a different class. Right? They had no, uh, but, uh, so it was a highly structured society. And uh, no one was looking after the small or the little people. So these institutions allowed lay and middle class individuals a place to have a community and self-governance. Really important. Really important. You could probably figure out it was real smart of the bigs to allow that because what might happen if you got very intelligent, very wealthy, and uh, uh, individuals, large numbers of them, excluded from any kind of leadership, what in due time would happen? Well, uh, talk about that. Yeah, they would revolt. They would revolt. You have to give people a place. And so it was, a, it was, a, it was an incredibly ingenious strategy. Uh, they gave the lay people a place, and furthermore, it bound the poor to the lay people. It was, a, it was an ingenious social structure. Uh, in the 16th century, that's the 1500s, there are 120 of these things. In that tiny little island, 120 of them. In 1723, there were 357 of them. When the Napoleon came into power, took over Venice, there was one. He got rid of them all because he didn't want anything in between him and people. He allowed no intermediate institutions. He didn't allow that in France either. All unions, all social clubs, uh, institutions, flat, no. He couldn't get rid of San Rocco because it was too wealthy and too powerful. So it endured. Okay, now this is a problem. Money is a problem, folks. Not for you. You don't have enough of it. But when you get enough of it, it's usually a problem. Uh, I have my mama always used to say, try me. Test me. But nobody tested her. She died poor. Uh, and many Scuola became wealthy and influential. San Rocco became extraordinarily wealthy. And they spent the money on themselves. They spent money on fan, uh, fantastic parades, fantastic uh, entertainment uh, uh, venues, and they built and hired the best of architects, sculptures. And so they just used their money to aggrandize themselves. So it's wealth fed ostentatious pride of the membership and 
the poor and the needy, which was their purpose, took second place. You can probably figure out that happens a lot even among the holiest of us. Uh, uh, well, as a result, San Rocco, the squala, the institution was subject to pu public ridicule. If they ever wanted to talk about a hypocrite, they just said San Rocco. Everybody knew what they were talking about. Right? Uh, they were publicly ridiculed for their extravagance and their hypocrisy. That's when Tintoretto comes into the scene. When he built the school, I'm going to get the pictures, just wait. Uh, when he built this school, he had two intentions. 64 of these canvases telling one single story. Complicated, but one single story. First of all, it was a public apology. With these paintings, the members of San Rocco were saying to the rest of Venice, we really are committed to that high work of ministering to the sick and poor. We really are. And if it seemed otherwise, we apologize. They're given an, 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 an explanation of what it is that they stand for. So when you look at these pictures, remember the, the, the storyline in there, which is uh, divine providence, is also a, a, a message to the world. This is what we stand for. The, my cousin has the biggest forearms of any short guy I know. And he's got a tattoo here. His brother made it. Good tattoos, too. I'm not fond of tattoos, but if you've got to have them, there's a good one. And there's a tattoo here. There's one here. There's one here. I mean, his, his forearms are like my thighs. Right? I said, to, hey, Tom, what, what, what you got there? And he said, country. He said, family. He said, courage. And country, family, courage, and honor. And he says, when I wake up in the morning, first thing I do is, he just like it. <laughs> now I know what I stand for and I'm ready to start the day. Right? Well, Tintoretto tint, tattooed that building. <laughs> So they might then know what this place stands for. Okay, that's the public side of it. There's also a private side of it. He was aiming at, he by the way, by all accounts was a very holy man and a very serious holy man and a good family man. Um, uh, besides being a world-class, all-time world-class uh, painter. He was interested in interior rec uh, restoration. For those who had the eyes to see, or shall I say the eyes to hear, those paintings would talk to the members of San Rocco and it would call them to a personal identification with Christ. Christ's self effacing love for the poor and for the people of ordinary classes. And when you see one of these paintings, you'll either see Christ in all of them or somebody who stands for Christ, such as Moses. And in those cases, there will be plenty of ordinary folks surrounding them. Often, they're all over the place. You see them and the Christ figures in the background. I mean, he's important, but he's in the background. Right? Guess who wasn't always in the background? Members of San Rocco. <laughs> and the, po the, and the, the poor people, uh, impoverished people, were in the shadows. Well, Tintoretto turns it all the way around. Okay, so this is just, this is just, go on, where are we? Okay, here's the program. Go on, please. It starts, as I tell the story, in the middle. Um, uh, you guys got a little picture, a little diagram here, right? You can thank me later. It's a really nice diagram. Right here. This is the upper room, big upper room. And we're right there in the middle of that big upper room. And right there is a picture. And while I'm turning my pages to tell you how big that son of a gun is, you tell me what's going on there. That thing is 27 feet long, or high, I guess you could say, and 17 feet uh, 
So 17 by, what did I say? 27? That was a big painting. What's going on? What do you see here? Go forward. Go forward first. I'm going to come right in here for, for you. Oh, what do you see there? Ooh, right. And, ooh, what's that? Ooh. Ooh. Now let's go back. Okay, this painting is a pretty neat because you've got a diagonal here and there's something going on up there. There's a diagonal here and right sort of the interface of the center of those diagonals, you've got this, which this fellow's pointing to. But nobody knows what that is, right? Fair enough, fair enough. Go on. Go on. Uh, let's go to the Bible, Numbers. Who can read that? Raise your hand if you can read that. All right. Would you please read it aloud? Me? Yeah, yeah. From Mount Hor, they set out on the Red Sea Road to bypass the land of Edom. But with their patience worn out by the journey, the people complained against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up from Egypt to die in this desert where there is no food or water? We're disgusted with this wretched food in punishment. The Lord sent among the people Sarah's serpents, which bit the people so that many of them died. Then the people say, came to Moses and said, We have sinned in complaining against the Lord and you. Pray to the Lord to take the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a seraph and mount it on a pole. And if anyone who has been bitten looks at it, he will recover. Moses accordingly made a bronze serpent and mounted it up on a pole. And whenever anyone who had been bitten by a serpent looked at the bronze serpent, he recovered. So just go back for a moment. No uh, more. So who do you think this is? And what do you think that is? A bronze serpent. And these people are being attacked by the serpents and they're getting, becoming sick and they're dying from it. But if before they die, they're able to get up here and take a look-see at that, they shall be healed. All right? Now, just imagine this is that hallway. And just imagine this is 100 feet from there to there. Uh, right in the middle would be where this painting is. Continue. Continue. All right. Down at this end, can you guys guess what that is? Who that is and who that is? Yeah, yeah, Adam and Eve. This is called the temptation of Adam. She got it in her hand and she's tempting Adam and you know the story. So that's right up here. Continue. So that's Adam, the moment of decision, and from that sin will come thirst, hunger, sickness, and death. We've already had God dealing with sickness and death in the Old Testament. Ah, oh, what's coming from that rock? Water. Water. That big painting's right here. So you got Adam and Eve, you got this big painting, and you saw the brazen serpent. So this is Moses feeding them. Continue. All right. Well, I don't know. Is that going for you? Yeah. And, oh, gosh. This is a bit confusing to see it on the reproduction. But can anybody figure it out? These people are holding up plates. And there's something white falling from heaven. Can you all guess what that is? That's the manna. They're hungry. They're out in the desert. That painting's right here. So you've got Adam and Eve. You've got Moses in the water. You've got Moses uh, healing the sick, uh, keep, uh, pr preserving them from death. And you've got Moses in the water continue. So you've got these three dominant images. The Lord provides for the needs of those who are gathered within the faithful, who are gathered within and faithful to the laws of Moses. Miraculous water, miraculous bread, miraculous healing. It's all very obvious. Continue. Oh, what are you down at the end? This is very hard to interpret. You almost need a, me to help you with it. Uh, this is a, a very foreshortened picture of... Uh, of the Passover feast. The Passover feast. All right? And do you guys remember what the Passover feast rec uh, 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 recollects? It's a moment in Jewish history where they recollect something. Huh? Talk so somebody can hear you. It's a leaving Egypt. Yeah, leaving Egypt, where, where, where the Lord uh, releases his people from that sort of slavery from Egypt. All right, and just before they leave, they have this 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 feast before the Passover. All right, 
and then ever after the Jews remember that. And we, we, we Christians, or I should put it this way, Catholics remember it, and a lot of other Christians do too, on Easter Sunday. But what do we recollect? What's our Passover? Easter Sunday, what do you do besides eggs? Easter Bunny? So what, Joseph? Talk up. Uh, yeah, the resurrection of Christ. Thank you. All right. So now, there is the Passover feast, and I can tell you that if you go there and you come right down here and look more or less at ground level, there's an altar. And at certain times, they would celebrate Mass on that altar. Continue. So, how do you read this? Well, Tentoretto's ceiling moves from the fall of Adam all the way to the Passover. And that is just above an altar. And now if there's something else going on, there are about, oh, I'm, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember the number of them, but we can count them. One, two, three, four, five. There are five big paintings on the walls. And on that wall over here. I'm not going to do that. On that wall over there. And the way you're and these are all from the New Testament. And the way you're supposed to read it is from, um, for instance, if we were to take, uh, if we were to take the, uh, that middle one, uh, what, so what my next one is, I can't remember. No, that's not Are you going, okay, and here, here's an example, for instance. This is Jesus feeding the, uh, feeding the, uh, the loaves and fishes to, to the people. And the next one? And this is the Last Supper. So on one side there's the la of the wall, there's the Last Supper. Over here is the, uh, the feeding uh, of the, uh, the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. And right up there, do you remember what that is? What's up there? The brazen serpent. No, no actually it's not. Uh, it's right up here. What's right up here? The manna. I can't even, no, I guess the manna's there. Sorry, folks. There's the manna. This guy's right here. And the previous one's right over here. And what you do is you read these things from top to bottom or from bottom to top. If you're reading from top to bottom, what does that word say? I can't read it. Foreshadows. Yeah, the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament. And that word says, uh, recapitulates. And the New Testament recapitulates the Old Testament. That's the way Catholics read the Bible. Okay? The meaning, the deep meaning of this scene here with Moses in the uh, Christ feeding the, uh, the people in the desert with manna, the real meaning of that comes down to this. And it all... Go backwards one, please, Becky. Or to this. Right? These are Jesus doing in spades or to a higher power, squared, or, or to the third power, what Moses was doing here. So you read them this way, you read them that way. And all the way down the line, that's happening. Let's go forward. Okay. Now, can anyone figure out what that image is? I, I mean, I'll tell you, it's a wall image. And it's supposed to relate to the, uh, it's supposed to relate to the brazen serpent up here. What's happening here? Who you, guys, who you guys think this is? Who do you think it is? Say Jesus in your right. <laughs> All right? Good. What's he doing? Don't say flying. <laughs> say what? The ascension. No, but real close. The resurrection. The resurrection. That's the resurrection. Go to the next uh, slide. Uh, ah, what do you see here? See, these are people on earth. What's happening there? That's the ascension. All right. Well, I leave it to you to see how. Uh, see, see what the next one is. No, you, you can leave that on there. Go, go for, you can leave that on. I leave it to you to figure out how uh, the brazen serpent raising up that staff with the brazen serpent on it, the, uh, the bronze serpent on it. If you look upon it, you will be saved from death. How that relates or foreshadows the resurrection and the ascension. Or how the resurrection and the ascension 
for, uh, pre recapitulate what was happening there, but tells you the hidden meaning behind it. All the way down the line, left and right. Do you see what I mean? These paintings talk to one another. And you can actually hear it with your eyes. Right? Now, so this is just, uh, I, I, I've already told you this. So we can skip that. John, uh, this, uh, yeah, yeah, no, go back there. Go back, go, 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 go on, go on, go on. No, 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 no. Forward, I'm sorry. Forward, forward, forward. Avante, avante. There we go. Uh, John, it's very interesting. He tells us how to interpret. You know, uh, he tells us what's going on. John, in, the gospel, in, 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 his, in his third letter, makes the connection between Jesus and the brazen serpent. Tintoretto didn't make it up. I certainly didn't make it up. Tintoretto didn't make it up. Actually, John didn't make it up. He figured it out. Right? Somebody, everybody else can read back there? Who can read? Yeah, you can read. You. Read that. Bob. No one who has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. All right. Now, we saw the resurrection. We saw the ascension. We see the brazen serpent being, uh, uh, being lifted up. John's interpreting that for us. In Scripture, Tintoretto's putting it in images. What does that have to do with San Rocco's the institution? Not there yet. Continue. Oh my goodness. This is not a very good reproduction, uh, but it's good enough. Remember this thing's 40 feet long. And so what is that, about 17 or 18 feet tall? Uh, it's actually much longer. These proportions are a little bit off. And what do you see in the middle? The crucifixion. Uh, you see a gathering of people over here. These are the guys throwing dice. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see there's probably John and there are the Marys uh, and uh, probably Joseph Arimathea or one of those characters. And, and look where Jesus is. What do you think this guy's doing? What do you think he's doing? This guy. No, you're, 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 it's a very good guess. It's just wrong. He's pulling somebody else up. He's pulling somebody up. Who do you think he's pulling up? Dismas. He's pulling up that poor sap. And that's Dismas. Or we say it's Dismas. Yeah, that, that is the, uh, that, that's the good thief. So what you see here is the actual lifting up of the cross. These guys are getting it all set up. I mean, these are your worker guys. They're doing a job. These are onlookers, some onlookers. Uh, this was apparently somewhat of a public place where people would walk by. So there's people coming back. Look at all these heads. Look at all those people. There's hardly a big there. Anyone that you could, except for these aren't bigs, they're about as poor as everybody else. Uh, you might see a, if they got a horse on, they're probably a big. But the rest of them are fairly ordinary people doing their work or just passing by. Continue. There's another image of it. And there's a sight line. Jesus is looking at somebody. Can you see who he's looking at? Somebody said John. Well, John's looking at Jesus, but who do you think Jesus is looking at? Let's do another picture. Let's see if we got another one there. That's a good image. Yeah. Ordinary guy, ordinary guy. Well, I'm talk about ordinary guy. It looks like he came out of London somewhere. Uh, ordinary guy. And if we had details, that's what you'd see all over the place. But Jesus is clearly staring at somebody. Go back, please. They're eye to eye. These two are talking with their eyes to one another. What do you think this guy's background is? Think he was a big? 
Nah. If he wasn't quite so unlucky and he didn't end up on a crucifix uh, on, a, on a cross, where do you think he might end up? How do you think he made a living? He's a thief. Kent, guys, he's called the good thief. Yeah, he's a robber. He's an outlaw. But who gets the eye contact? Those two. That's that's not an that's not an accident. That's not just sort of nice. It's absolutely important that Tintoretto did that. He did that knowingly because who's he talking to here? He's really not talking to the people out there with his apologia. He's talking to, who do you think he's talking to when he puts something like that? Oh, I should have told you. Do you know where this big painting is? We saw it. It's in this room here. It's in the, what they call the albergo or the meeting room. This is where the San Rocco bigs meet. Who do you think? Who do you think Tintoretto's painting this to move somebody's heart? Guess who's? The Bigs. The Bigs of San Rocco. Exactly. Exactly. The very, very wealthy, much honored lay citizens of Venice who, for the past generation, have been uh, using their, their gifts to pump themselves up and say, ha, ah, look at my institution. Right. Now he's asking for a conversion of heart. Okay, continue, please. On. So, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about good works. These guys were dedicated to good works. Why? Because they just got kind of sympathetic when they'd see somebody hungry. Well, maybe. Uh, you know, they just were doing a good deed like Boy Scouts. Well, maybe. No, they're actually following a New Testament command, and I shall read this. The mandate for the works of mercy comes from the letter of James and his concern for the brothers and sisters in need of clothes and without enough food. And James says, my brothers, do not let class distinctions enter into your faith, uh, into your faith in Jesus our glorified Lord. Listen, my brothers, it was those who were poor, according to the world, that God chose to be rich with in faith and to be heir to in the kingdom which he promised to those who loved him. Whoever acts without mercy will be judged without mercy, but mercy can afford, uh, mercy can afford to laugh at that judgment. What a great line. Mercy can afford to laugh at judgment. Uh, it is by deeds, not by only believing, that someone is justified. So that's, that's, that's the scripture mandate. Continue. So the program of Sacra Purita. Tintoretto here is incorporating a universal call of the Christian to works of mercy. And there's lots and lots of evidence that his spirituality was probably very much influenced by, by a devotion to St. Francis. He might even have been a third order of uh, Franciscan. Anyway, throughout this, and I'll just show you a couple pictures that show that. He always, de always depicts Christ especially identifying himself with simple and the poor of the earth. And he always shows Christ. He doesn't have a single picture of Christ, but that he's not surrounded by them. Christ is always among them. He is one of them, even as he serves them. Uh, I like this line. It's my own. Uh, he does not impress his divinity upon them. Uh, and observe how often the poor hold the foreground in Tintoretto's paintings and in their poverty, in their poverty, they encounter Christ. It sounds like our Pope now, Francis, talks this way. The viewer is invited to be among the viewer, which are the bigs. They're invited to be Christ among the poor and to be poor so as to encounter Christ. Continue. This is one of the uh, pictures, which is one of my favorite ones. I think it's down on the lower floor. But the, this, these are the shepherds coming to visit. Can anyone see where Christ is? Is he on this quadrant? This quadrant, this quadrant, this quadrant. He's there, right? You have to look for him. You look at some of them. He's got the big halo. You know, he's right there in the middle. Everybody's circling around. No, 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 no. Uh, who, who are, these guys are in the foreground. And you look at them, and I'm sure when they looked at it, they saw the craftsmen of their day. 
They saw people dressed in the, in the working classes and some of them maybe even poor. Down there with a cow and the rooster. And here are the ladies uh, bringing some food. I can imagine that. Common people, ordinary people, poor people bringing food to Christ. Go on. Here's the, here is the uh, Last Supper. Can anyone see where Christ is? Do you think he's down here? Yes or no? No. Do you think he's back there? No. So he must be at the table somewhere. You think he's in the front part of the table or the back part of the table? Huh? Yes. There's Christ. He's not in the foreground. He's in the background. And these are ordinary people. I can't actually interpret these. I think these are sort of mythical people. I'm not sure. That looks like a musical instrument. I'm not completely sure, but they're certainly not bigs. Uh, so they're being served, and they're with the apostles, who you all know are fairly ordinary folk for the most part. Uh, continue. So here you got the two pictures. Jesus, Jesus. How many people? Lots. He's in the midst of ordinary people. Continue. Um, Oh, gosh, I wish I could show you the big one. Uh, in this painting, which is in... No, you can't. Uh, I don't have it for you. Uh, this is the, the ascent to Calvary. And it shows him going up a hill and then up another hill. And we're right here. And again, uh, in that big painting, Jesus is... You can make him out without any trouble. But one, two, three, four... These aren't cruel people by their faces anyway. They're just doing their job. That's probably Simon who's helping Jesus carry. But again, just in this one little snippet, you see Jesus surrounded by ordinary people in, the, in, in a moment of great suffering. Continue. And then we get to this one. Continue. We've already seen it. Continue. And we're at the end. So you guys can wake up now. <laughs> uh, we do have a few minutes. I don't know that I'm going to recapitulate it, but um, there's a lot going on there, wouldn't you say? Huh? And there's history. Right? And there's an artist who's telling a story, but that story has a point to it, and a point to, to those guys there. Not just universal or abstract. He's talking to real individuals who are engaged in life. Right? This, this is actually one, two, three rooms I showed you, or parts of three rooms I showed you. Now when you go in there, and you, you, you're going to need some time to see that, if you want to see it. Uh, or you want to you see what they're saying, let's put it that way. Right? But again, I, I go back to my title. It might make some sense now. Uh, a Civic Work of Mercy, the meaning of Tintoretto's program for the Scuola, you know what that is, Gran San Rocco. Um, and so, uh, my wife, I told some of my students today, my wife's a little envious of this room. Uh, there was a while when I think she thought I spent more time with that room than with her. And I certainly listen better to that room than I do to her. And she was very well aware of that. But uh, I told her that it was part of my job. But anyway, uh, it is a little bit like romancing a room, and there are a number of rooms like that. I have some favorites. Mrs. Davies told you about the Raphael Stanzo del Signatura. Uh, there's uh, Saint uh, uh, Fra Angelico in the uh, convent of, of uh, San Marco in Venice, and then there's one I haven't come to yet, but uh, Giotto has a tiny little chapel that's magnificent. It's like my first experience of it, so I thought I was in like Alice going down the tunnel, and I'm in another world. When I walked through that door of the Scrivani Chapel, I was in another world altogether. It's tattooed. Head, side, bottom, everything. Uh, it's fabulous. And it tells a story. A story f for people of that time, but it's interesting. However historically particular it is, these artists made it universal also. That's why we can talk here, think about it. I think you can only see something like that in, in Europe. Maybe I don't know enough about 
South America, Africa, or Asia. I'm pretty sure you would find something like this in Asia. Not the Christian story, but a, a whole program. But mm, pretty hard to find one in America. You have to go to Europe for that. Or listen to me. Questions, comments, complaints, clarifications? Raise your hand. Any of you ever heard of Tintoretto before? Raise your hand if you have. One, two, three. See how ignorant you are? <laughs> we all are. Uh, um, uh, how many of you have been to Venice before? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe eight or nine. See how inexperienced you are? We all are in some respect. And you don't have to go to Europe to get experience, but you do have to have eyes to see and ears to hear beyond the ordinary. And I can tell you that for every hundred people that go into that building, only one or two of them are likely to hear or see a dang thing. They just check the rest. They're in there for 10 minutes. Oh, hum. Check it. I saw that. Oh, and they'll go like this, and the next thing you know, it'll be all over on Facebook almost immediately. All right? But they didn't see or hear it. This takes time. Attention. You have to be touched by the beauty of it. Beauty is a terrible thing. It causes you to waste a lot of time in the beautiful. You could actually be doing something practical or productive. Instead, you just dwell upon the beautiful. No questions. Nothing interesting here. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, just. Can we go here to this building with the, the our, our class program? I don't know what they do now. Each uh, director does things differently. When. Uh, in the years that I went, uh, we would go to Venice, I think, except for one year. We all went, always went to Venice, and there were certain trips that everybody went on, but then there would be free times in which different professors would offer different options. I offer, always offered this option. Uh, so it, it was always on an optional one. There's, this place is too much to see. You can't see everything, so you have to break off a little bit. And it's probably unfair to make everybody see the same things, but everybody should see some of the same things, but then you should have. So, but you go there, I don't know what the ticket is, but it's perfectly reasonable. It's really well kept. I told the story of the history of that building and the meaning of it. Another story is, who takes care of that building that it's so perfect? You know, preserving old things is really an art. And we are so dedicated to that. So great. They have to be grateful to people who do that kind of thing. That's one of the most. There's about four or five really greatly preserved buildings, and that's one. It helps to have money, like San Rocco does. But even so, if you don't have money, I mean, if you have all the money in the world, but you don't have taste or you don't have generosity, it doesn't do any good. Some of us have all kinds of taste. Some of us have generosity, <laughs> but we don't have no money. You have to have all three. Just remember that. Some of you are going to be rich. It won't do you much good if you don't also have, have taste and generosity. But you put those three together and the world will love you.